Now, the trial of the NHS nurse Lucy Letby is continuing at Manchester Crown Court. She wept as she told the court that she was devastated at being accused of murdering seven young babies and the attempted murder of ten others. Asked by her defence lawyer if she'd done anything wrong, no, she replied. She told the jury that she'd only ever done her best to care for the babies. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations, the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven newborns and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. The jury has now been sitting for nine months. The prosecution and defence have finished outlining their cases and the jury will shortly be asked to decide whether Lucy Letby is guilty or not guilty of the 22 charges that she faces. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for The Mail. I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. So all the evidence in the case has now been heard by the jury and we're now approaching the end of this trial. Regular listeners will know that the babies in this case are not being named for legal reasons and the identities of their families are also being protected. So we're calling them babies A to Q. In this episode, we'll hear Lucy Letby's barrister, Ben Myers Casey, claim the prosecution case is based on a presumption of guilt rather than innocence. We'll also bring you the moment he accused consultants of heaping the blame on her to cover poor performance on the ward. We'll examine why he claimed the medical research into air embolus was poor and could not be relied upon. And we'll explain why Lucy Letby started to cry in the dock. Welcome to episode 44, The Presumption of Guilt. So this week, Liz, we're focusing on Lucy Letby's barrister, Ben Myers Casey, who spent five days giving his closing speech to the jury. And he began by saying that what struck him when he listened to the closing speech of the prosecutor, Nick Johnson Casey, was that Lucy Letby couldn't win. He said whatever she'd done or not done, said or not said, whether there was evidence or an absence of evidence, she was guilty in their eyes. He said the prosecution case was full of inconsistencies and they'd constantly altered their version of events when the evidence did not match their theory of what happened. Instead of being presumed innocent, the prosecution had assumed Lucy Letby is guilty. In fact, their case is fuelled by the presumption of guilt and riddled with it, Mr Myers said. Lucy Letby is present when something happens. Guilty. She isn't there when something happens. Guilty. She's just left the unit. Guilty. She's just turned up for work. Guilty. She makes a note. Guilty. She doesn't make a note. Guilty. She fails to sign off observations, just like other nurses fail to sign off observations. But in Miss Letby's case, guilty. She signs observations in another nurse's chart, exactly like other nurses do, but in Miss Letby's case, guilty. A baby in her care shows no sign of deterioration before an event. The prosecution say, aha. That's easy. Guilty. A baby in her care does show signs of deterioration before an event. Guilty. She doesn't cry. Guilty. Or she doesn't cry in the right place. Guilty. She can't win. You have seen this time and time again, this twisting and turning. What really is at work is best described as a presumption of guilt, and this prosecution case is fueled by it and riddled by it. No matter what Lucy Letby says, does or doesn't do, It is slotted into the ever-flexible, ever-changing theory of guilt. It doesn't matter how inconsistent. Everything is treated as evidence of guilt. Mr Myers said it was hard to imagine more upsetting and distressing allegations than the ones in this trial. And he told the jury it was only human to want to seek blame and retribution for the parents, especially those who'd lost babies. But he urged them against this. You have to be careful not to convert natural sympathy into a desire to convict, or a readiness to accept things that have been said about Miss Letby, which may not be true or accurate. That must be a massive danger in a case like this. 
and you have to guard against that urge. Mr Myers also accused the prosecution of using inflammatory language to characterise Lucy Letby. He said words like attacking, sabotaging, gaslighting, manipulating and playing God had been used to influence the jury against her. He said she was not a genius with an infallible, excellent memory like they'd suggested, although she was capable of standing up for herself. At other times, though, she was scared, anxious and struggling to hold it together, he said. The prosecution portrayal is back to front. They have to make her into someone she is not. They have done that to compensate for the fact that they don't have the evidence they need. He also showed the jury the picture of Lucy Letby's kitchen notice board again. You might remember this was the board that had several cards pinned onto it and was shown to the court much earlier in the trial. And we've talked about this before in the podcast. One of the cards had a picture of a star and said number one godmother awarded to Lucy Letby on it. Another was a birthday card apparently sent from her cats which said happy birthday mummy, love Tigger and Smudge. There was also a card with her parents' photograph on that had been mocked up in the style of a newspaper with the headline Hay Festival Exclusive which Lucy Letby explained was a novelty card from the Hay Literature Festival that they'd attended. Mr Myers told the jury the board provided a snapshot of the real Lucy Letby, the person she was before she was arrested, a person who he said was very different to the caricature of her being presented by the prosecution. You will have formed an opinion on her evidence. Quite a serious character. Some people are frothy extroverts. Not everyone is. She wanted to be a nurse since she was at school, started studying nursing at university, did placements at the Countess of Chester, because she wanted to care for children and babies, which she has done over the years. Hundreds of them. Hundreds. It is important because it shows on one view the type of person she is. Various medical professionals spoke out about what an excellent, caring and committed nurse Lucy Letby was. One of the issues was how much she wanted to care for intensive care babies. We say Miss Letby is bound to be present when serious events unfolded, because she was so flexible on a unit that was overstretched. Mr Myers accepted Lucy Letby was an avid user of Facebook who'd searched for the parents of her alleged victims days, weeks and years after they were allegedly killed or harmed. He said that if she only searched for the parents of the babies involved in the case, it would be suggestive of a pattern. But he pointed out that she'd made more than 2,300 searches over the period covered by the charges and only 31 of them involved parents at the centre of this case. Four of the families had never been searched for at all, he said, and she'd also looked up other parents of children she'd cared for, who weren't part of the case. On the issue of the 257 handover sheets and other medical documents found by the police at her home following her arrest, Mr Myers reminded the jury that Lucy Letby had told them she collected paper. But she was not a collector in a stamp collector kind of way, he said. What she'd meant was she was someone who accumulated paper, because she didn't throw anything away. So Mr Myers reminded the jury that it was not up to Lucy Letby to prove her innocence or to explain what might have happened to the babies. But he said it made no sense that this well-trained and apparently dedicated nurse had for some inexplicable reason decided to kill or try to kill children. Instead, he said the deaths and collapses more likely happened because of a baby's health or condition, the state of the unit, staffing pressures, failings in care, or because the unit was taking on too many babies with too high care requirements. He reminded the jury about the gang of four, the four senior consultants, Dr Stephen Breary, Dr Ravi Jayram, Dr John Gibbs, and a doctor who we can't identify for legal reasons who we've been calling Dr B that Lucy Letby claims conspired to blame her for the deaths and collapses, to cover up failings on the neonatal unit. He insisted these doctors had not given evidence against her without motives of their own. One by one, these senior consultants have lined up in their evidence to do their bit to do down Miss Letby. Some blatantly, some understated, but all designed, in fact, to assist this prosecution. This case is a prime opportunity to hide poor performance and bad outcomes. The evidence is clear. The unit was unusually busy in 2015 and 2016, and busy with babies that had complex needs. 
At the same time, there was no change in staffing levels to accommodate this. The blame for absolutely everything has been heaped on her. Mr Myers also claimed the scientific research on air embolus, or air in the blood, was so poor it could not be safely used to support the prosecution case. He said both the prosecution experts, Dr Dowie Evans and Dr Sandy Bowen, had relied on a single paper written more than 30 years ago by scientists in Canada as the basis of their knowledge. This paper showed one in five of 53 children affected by air embolism had developed a migrating discoloration on their skin, which was typically pale, with flitting bright pink patches. As a basis for conviction for someone of murder and attempted murder, it is tenuous in the extreme. That meagre piece of research has carried into guesswork in this case. Scientific evidence needs to be sufficiently reliable if you're going to rely on it. What guidance you have had from the experts has been applied inconsistently throughout the case. The evidence is so poor it cannot be safely used to support these allegations. And he claimed all three of the prosecution's experts, Dr Dowie Evans, Dr Sandy Bowen and to a lesser extent Dr Andreas Marnarides, were not independent. He reminded the jury that Dr Evans' credentials had been strongly criticised by a judge in a separate case in the Court of Appeal and he suggested it was incredible that the prosecution had based their case on his theories. All three prosecution witnesses were partisan, he said, and they decided to support a theory of guilt rather than deal with the facts. But Mr Myers spent the majority of his speech around three full days contradicting Mr Johnson's assertion that the babies in the case had received good care at the Countess and that there'd been few shortcomings in their treatment. In fact, Mr Myers insisted the opposite was true. He took the jury through each child in turn and pointed to why he said they'd received suboptimal care and why there was not enough evidence for the jury to convict Lucy Letby of the charges against her. So we're going to take you briefly through what he said about each child and why he claimed Lucy Letby is not guilty of harming them. For baby A, the twin baby boy who was Lucy Letby's first alleged murder victim, there'd been a delay of more than four hours in administering him fluids, Mr Myers said. It was also close to handover, and the unit was busy when Lucy Letby supposedly injected air into his IV drip while two of her colleagues were in the room, he said. None of the doctors made a note of a rash on his body in the medical notes, and it wasn't until Dr David Harkness and Dr J Ram gave statements to the police years later that they detailed the strange discoloration on his tummy, he said. In his twin sister Baby B's case, Mr Myers admitted there'd been no obvious poor care, save to say Dr Hartness had tried five times to get an IV line into her before he finally succeeded. Mr Myers accepted some of the doctors had described a striking rash on her abdomen, but he said that in itself was not diagnostic of an air embolus and instead claimed her collapse was a consequence of her prematurity. Baby C, Mr Myers said, was so tiny when he was born 10 weeks early that his chances of survival were small. He had pneumonia and had been producing dark bile aspirates in the 24 hours before he died on June the 14th. In general, doctors and nurses had been slow to react to his problems and he should have been transferred to a more specialist centre. Mr Myers also claimed the evidence suggested Lucy Letby was somewhere else, away from Nursery One, when he collapsed. For baby D, the only full-term baby in the case, there was a failure to give both her and her mother antibiotics, Mr Myers said. Baby D was an unwell baby from birth and there was no evidence to show Lucy Letby injected her with air multiple times, as it's alleged by the prosecution, he said. Fact. Baby D's mother's waters membraned 60 hours before she was born. Fact. She should have been given antibiotics, but they failed to do that. That is suboptimal. Fact. By 12 minutes of age, Baby D was displaying signs of being ill. Fact. She should have been given antibiotics from that point or as soon as possible. That didn't happen for some time. Four hours. That's suboptimal. Fact. Baby D was born with pneumonia. Fact. She was so ill that by 10pm she had been ventilated in order to breathe properly. Fact. She was on the ventilator for 11 hours. 
The following morning she was taken off it, but there were continuing signs of respiratory difficulties until she was put onto CPAP breathing support. Fact. She desaturated after being taken off CPAP. Fact. Dr. Andrew Brunton took the decision to take her off CPAP. Within half an hour of that, she collapsed fatally. Fact. The post-mortem identified pneumonia in the lungs with acute lung damage. In Baby E's case, there'd been a failure to intubate or give him a blood transfusion in time when his bleeding ran out of control before he died, Mr Myers said. It wasn't the defence case that Baby E's mother was lying when she claimed she'd heard her son screaming as she delivered his milk to the unit at 9pm on August 3rd, 2015. But Mr Myers insisted there was a question of accuracy and reliability. Screaming. Horrendous. We say it can't have been like that. It is happening in the real world, in a relatively busy unit, whatever the time is. How on earth is that not going to raise the concerns of other people? Baby F, the twin brother of Baby E, was poisoned with insulin, but there was no evidence Lucy Letby was the person who interfered with the bag of feed given to him via a drip on August the 4th, Mr Myers said. We say there would be nothing quick about what the prosecution allege. It involves getting a syringe and the bag, drawing up the insulin and injecting it without arising suspicion and getting caught. It's quite easy to make the allegations, but it would be quite difficult to carry out. Mr Myers also said it was completely unrealistic to suggest Lucy let be contaminated a second stock bag of feed and that she'd predicted it would be later given to baby F by an unsuspecting colleague when she clocked off that night. It's like a series of Russian dolls of improbability. How on earth is this a targeted attack unless Miss Letby had a Nostradamus-like ability to read the future? This is completely unrealistic. Baby G was a very premature baby girl, born at just 23 weeks, who should never have been cared for at the Countess, Mr Myers said. He claimed the evidence showed Lucy Letby was sitting with a colleague at the nursing station when she's accused of trying to murder baby G by overfeeding her milk at quarter past two in the morning on September the 7th. The evidence against her is also weak in relation to a further two attempts to kill a fortnight later on September the 21st, he said. He reminded the jury about a final alleged attack when Lucy Letby is accused of turning off a monitor and sabotaging baby G while she was behind a privacy screen after doctors had inserted a new cannula. Mr Myers insisted the evidence of the shift leader who told the jury that one of those doctors had later apologised to her, later in the shift for failing to turn Baby G's monitor back on, proved Lucy Letby was not responsible. We say the incident with the screen and monitor is something she is being blamed for, which is most definitely not reasonable. It is shameful the way she is being held responsible for something that we now know more about. Baby H's case was one where there was significant suboptimal care, Mr Myers said. She was the baby girl who had a punctured lung and needed three chest strains to aid her breathing before she collapsed. She recovered after eventually being moved to Arrow Park Hospital for more specialist care and Lucy Letby is accused of trying to kill her twice on consecutive night shifts in September 2015. Mr Myers listed five instances when baby H received poor care at the Countess. He said there'd been... A failure to give her surfactant for 36 hours. Now this is the substance which helps develop the lungs of premature babies. A delay in putting her on a ventilator. A failure to remove a dangerous butterfly needle inserted to drain air from her chest cavity. A failure to properly sedate her after she was placed on a ventilator. And a delay in inserting or properly securing a second chest drain. Here we have a catalogue of suboptimal practice which made Baby H's position sequentially worse. The fact that she improved at Arrow Park was not surprising. That list, that failure to improve, had nothing to do with Miss Letby. Baby I, Mr Myers said, was a fragile neonate, capable of deteriorating from almost nothing. Over her short three-month life, she suffered regular drops in oxygen, often had a swollen tummy, there were ongoing concerns about a bowel problem, and she struggled to gain weight, he said. Lucy Letby is accused of pumping air into her on three occasions before finally murdering her on the fourth attempt on October the 23rd, 2015. For baby J, nurses at the Countess had struggled to manage her stomas following surgery for her bowel problem, Mr Myers said. 
He reminded the jury that several nurses had told them that a baby with stomas was unusual for the Countess and that baby Jay's mother had also said she didn't think the hospital was properly geared up to dealing with her daughter's needs. When we say the Countess was receiving too many babies of too high acuity, we say that on the basis of evidence like this. Mr Myers suggested the two collapses which caused her seizures shortly before handover on November the 27th could have been linked to an infection around her cannula. He claimed there was no evidence to say Lucy Letby was in the room with baby J at the time, that although the prosecution experts could find no natural cause for the collapse, neither could they pinpoint any mechanism for harm. In the case of baby K, Mr Myers said her mother should have been transferred to a more specialist hospital before she gave birth to her extremely premature 25-week gestation daughter. She was a very small and extremely poorly baby who received poor care at the Countess, he said. He reminded the jury that Lucy Letby is accused of tampering with her breathing tube and according to Dr Jram, he interrupted her mid-attack. But she disputed Dr Jram's account, Mr Myers said. If he'd caught her standing over baby K doing nothing, it was incredible that he'd not blown the whistle to hospital managers or called the police, he said. If you strip this back to what's being alleged, he would call the police. Dr Jram said he didn't have the training. Well, I don't know what they teach you at consultant school, but how so many of them were struck silent during the course of these events is amazing. How can you possibly, in the circumstances described by the consultants, how can you do nothing, certainly for two of them, Dr Breary and Dr Jram, for a period of 12 months? For baby L, the second twin boy poisoned with insulin, Mr Myers said the expert evidence was that up to four bags of dextrose would have to have been tampered with over 53 hours between April the 9th and April the 11th, 2016. He said it was unrealistic that whoever was poisoning the bags had done so so many times and suggested the prosecution had contrived an artificial theory of what happened to get around the bag changes. Whoever was doing this would have to have kept getting the insulin from somewhere and bringing it in, say nothing about having to add it to a bag that was already hanging. The mechanics are unrealistic. This can't be explained by saying someone has done a job lot of dextrose bags. We know 15 bags of dextrose were kept in there. How was Lucy Letby going to predict the ones that were going to be used? In his brother, Baby M's case, Lucy Letby is accused of trying to murder him on the same shift by injecting him with air. He said there were subtle signs that Baby M was deteriorating prior to his collapse at 4pm, including a reference to a slightly swollen abdomen, an increased work of breathing and a bile aspirate. Again, the barrister claimed the prosecution experts had contorted their theory around Air Embolus to point the finger at her. He said it was utterly unbelievable to suggest that the air had crept down the drip into his bloodstream after Lucy Letby helped administer antibiotics at 3.45. Air into the bloodstream should be very, very rapid. It should not take 15 or 16 minutes. It doesn't make sense. In Baby N's case, Mr Myers said the hospital did not have the clotting agent that was needed for the management of his haemophilia for more than two weeks after his birth. He claimed there wasn't any evidence that Lucy Letby was in his nursery when he was found screaming after his designated nurse, Christopher Booth, went on his break just after 1am on June the 3rd, 2016. Nor were there any signs of blood, which you would expect if he'd been assaulted, or any skin discoloration or rash to link to air embolus, as the prosecution experts allege, Mr Myers said. Dr Bowen suggested there had been no examination of his mouth. She is throwing that out there as a way of trying to prop up what she's saying. If baby N was crying for 20 to 30 minutes, you would hardly miss blood from his mouth. Mr Myers also questioned whether doctors at the Countess, who struggled to intubate baby N when he collapsed multiple times a fortnight later, were up to the job. He reminded the jury that when Dr Frank Potter, a specialist from Alder Hay Hospital in Liverpool, arrived that evening, he managed to get the breathing tube in at the first attempt. It came down to a question of skill and experience. He had it, and the doctors at the Countess of Chester did not. For baby O, the first of the triplets allegedly murdered by Lucy Letby, Mr Myers said the medical notes indicated he had a developing problem with his abdomen by the afternoon of June the 23rd. 
Lucy Letby had a student nurse shadowing her on that shift, and the prosecution are unclear about when she's supposed to have injected him with air, he said. None of the clinicians noted the rash or discoloration on Baby O's skin that was witnessed by his father, and it was their case that the liver injury, discovered after his death, was most likely inflicted during CPR, he said. He also reminded the jury about the evidence of Baby O's mother, who told them Lucy Letby was very upset after his death, and he claimed the fact that she'd searched for her on Facebook on the anniversary of his death showed she was thinking of the triplets, but nothing more. For his brother, Baby P, Mr Myers said there was no evidence Lucy Letby sabotaged his care before she finished her shift on June the 23rd. There was also several staff in the nursery the next day when she is supposed to have injected air into his feeding tube again the following morning. Mr Myers claimed doctors had set the pressure on his ventilator too high, which caused a punctured lung that was not diagnosed quickly enough. He was also given a too high a dose of adrenaline and Lucy Letby was being blamed for these mistakes to cover up for the hospital's failings, he said. And he suggested that claims from Dr B that Baby P's breathing tube had been dislodged had not been noted by anyone on duty at the time. He said Lucy Letby's comment, he's not leaving here alive, is he, simply reflected the emotion of what was happening. It did not prove she was a killer. She did or said things that reflected the emotion of the situation. We've seen it before in the case where she has misjudged the situation. It may be consistent with social awkwardness. It does not prove murder. If Lucy Letby is as smart and in control as the prosecution would have you believe, the last thing she would say to the consultant in charge is, he's not leaving here alive. Baby Hugh's collapse was an event taken out of all proportion and context, Mr Myers said. He claimed the allegation of attempted murder was only on the indictment because Lucy Letby was on duty and there was no evidence she'd done anything to harm him. The nursery was busy at around 9.10am on June the 25th and she could not have had the opportunity to attack, he said. There were also issues lurking with his condition, which was evidence of the early stages of a developing bowel problem. And the clear fluid he vomited, which Lucy Letby is accused of forcing down his feeding tube, was in fact mucus produced by the baby himself, Mr Myers claimed. So after lunch on the fifth day of his closing speech, Mr Myers spent around an hour wrapping up, and he stressed that of all the coincidences in the case, no one had seen or witnessed Lucy Letby attack any baby. We have seen over and over again how the mere presence of Lucy Letby has become the sole explanation for what happened, sometimes without the need for any other evidence at all. One thing that's constant above all is Lucy Letby was not seen to do any of the alleged acts. It's crucial to keep that in mind. In a case where we have been asked to look at the coincidences by the prosecution, that has to be a coincidence above all others. There's a reason for that coincidence because there's no direct evidence of her doing any of the acts alleged against her. And that reason, however unwelcome in some quarters, is that she did not do this. It can't keep happening like that if she did. Mr Myers said she was a dedicated nurse who'd worked on the unit for years before the alleged attacks began. The only thing that changed in 2015, he said, was the number of babies being admitted to the unit and the fact they had more serious health problems. Between June 2015 and June 2016, the neonatal unit took more babies than it would usually care for and it took babies with greater care needs. You have heard that repeatedly. And in that same year, there was an increase in the number of deaths and type of collapses you are looking at in this trial. What did not change was Miss Letby. She had been a neonatal nurse for years. That was what she was dedicated to. She cared for hundreds of babies. She did not suddenly change her behaviour in 2015 and 2016. What changed was the babies cared for on the unit in terms of their numbers and needs, and, we say, the inability of this unit to cope but no one is going to come here and admit that to you, are they? Finally, Mr Myers concluded by asking the jury to bear in mind that Lucy Letby is not the person now that she was back in 2015. She began crying as he pointed to her in the dock and explained how, back then, she was a happy, dedicated nurse and not the killer that's been characterised by the prosecution. Please keep at the forefront of your mind the person she was at the time these events were happening not what she has been reduced to. I am saying this on her behalf 
because no one else will say it. She was hardworking, deeply committed. She had a happy life, loved her work, and was there much of the time because she was committed and loved being a nurse. For a system that wanted to apportion blame when it failed, she was the obvious target on the evidence, not because of what she was seen to do, oh no, because she was there. We ask for fairness and balance and a realistic assessment of the evidence in this case, based upon the presumption of innocence, not on the presumption of guilt. And if you do that, you will reach the right verdicts. We say that the right verdicts are verdicts of not guilty and those are the verdicts we ask you to return. So that's it for episode 44. It's the judge's turn next. He'll be summing up almost nine months of evidence to the jury before he sends them out to consider their verdict. I'll be in court as usual, and you can read my reports in the mail and on Mail Plus. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Liz Hull. You can give us a rating and you can share the podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Lucy Letby Trial, or follow me, at Radio Caroline. Or send us an email at thetrialoflucyletby at gmail.com. See you then. See you then.